Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Go on, my son. Well, Father, I... I made my mom listen to the 1977 Hobbit movie soundtrack twice on our way back from Florida. I don't really think that that's... I also spend most of my household income on antique ship postcards. Okay. Now, that's not technically a sin, but that's weird. How about you stop doing that anyway? Yes, Father. Now, do you have any actual sins? Yeah. Um... How, how about I get you started? Let's, let's talk about your upload schedule. Ocean Liner postcards are a common addition to any naval enthusiast's collection. Even I have a few. Anybody who's experienced in the world of postcards may recognize a few of these. These ones of Queen Mary are so common that I use mine as coasters, but some are a little rarer, like this one I have of the Olympic. However, of all of my postcards, this one of the Adriatic is probably my favorite. It's got some writing on it and even a date and an address. But due to the sloppy, old-timey handwriting, I can't really make out most of it. I've spent hours going through old travel records trying to find out anything I can about this postcard, but alas, I've had no luck. If any of you feel so inclined to help me, knock yourselves out. And yes, I know how to read cursive. In fact, I'm one of those sinners who writes everything in cursive. The Big Four class of White Star Liners popped up shortly after a period of great change in ocean liner design, a time when the concept of a superliner first emerged. Many naval historians, which yes, that is a real job, believe the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa was the first true superliner, with four funnels and a 655-foot length. The SS Simric was White Star Line's own newest vessel in that era, 12,500 gross registered tons to Willie's 14,300. Simric was not significantly smaller, but to most people with brains she would not be considered a superliner. Simric's most notable attribute is that she was not designed with speed in mind, as most previous premium White Star liners had been. She wasn't particularly gorgeous, but she had a spacious and comfortable interior, mostly because she was initially designed to be a part passenger, part livestock carrier. You know, back when they couldn't tell the difference. This also meant she had the slower, more consistent speed of a cargo ship. This slower and more reliable service speed allowed her for a heavier focus on passenger comfort, which proved far more profitable than competing for the fastest ship. She wasn't a brilliantly laid out or carefully designed flagship like the Majestic or Germanic, and she sure as hell wouldn't be setting any records, but she's still notable in White Star Line history. Now what does any of this have to do with the Big Four? Virtually nothing. Well, kinda. White Star Line gave up on chasing speed records pretty soon after the success of the SS Simric, and when White Star built their first superliner, the RMS Oceanic of 1899, it gave them an opportunity to test the new Comfort Over Speed model. It was wildly successful, and quickly White Star prepared to construct a sister for the Oceanic. These plans fell through for whatever reason, and those previously laid down keel plates were repurposed for an entire new class of ships. Thus is conceived the RMS Celtic, a two-funnel liner and the first of the Big Four class. Around this time, Thomas Henry Ismay, the lively and brilliant head of the White Star Line, died. One of his final acts was the beginning of White Star's transition into the Comfort Over Speed model, which they intended to perfect on the RMS Celtic. Harland and Wolfe, who constructed virtually every White Star Line ship, focused all of their efforts into the construction of Celtic to ensure the vessel matched the vision of its designers. Although Simric was the first instance of the Comfort Over Speed model, I'd argue the RMS Celtic and the Big Four class as a whole was the first intentional focus on its implementation. Now the fact that the Oceanic ran a moderate service speed instead of chasing records was certainly no accident, but Oceanic was completed so soon after Simric entered service that I doubt her earliest designs were developed with comfort over speed in mind like Celtic was. The next three years saw more ships and more success for the White Star Line with the Celtic completed in 1901, her sister Cedric completed in 1903, and the construction of Baltic nearly complete by December of that year. The fourth of the Celtic class, Adriatic, was ordered soon after, with some sweet and savory interior improvements remedying the failures White Star saw in her predecessors. Adriatic's interiors were terribly fancy, and White Star was really focusing on the comfort aspect for the ship. Let's start by what makes Adriatic different from her sisters. Now I know what you're thinking, they all look alike, but you can't say that, it's racist. Adriatic was the first ship to have an indoor swimming pool. You can thank her for these monstrosities. This feature was particularly popular and was emulated on most major subsequent liners. I found some sources claiming Titanic was the first ship to have a swimming pool, which I find utterly appalling, and uh, my resulting actions may require me to go back to confession. The pool was pretty small, as was the Olympics, but still notable given the popularity of pools on ships today. By this point, indoor pools, even in hotels, were pretty rare. And as for ocean liners, forget about it. 
Even if life is kind of terrible at this point, people can still find enjoyment in the same things we do today. Stuffing their throats with ungodly amounts of food. Adriatic's dining saloon was quite tasteful, featuring mostly Jacob bean tastes and lots of ivory white with wooden pillars for support. It also wasn't a true dining saloon as it featured individual tables instead of long tables seen on most ocean liners up to this point. According to Scientific American, the room sat about 400 persons. Adriatic officially accommodated 425 first-class passengers, so my guess is that Scientific American just goofed. I can't find a consistent source for this, but I think it's fair to say breakfast would be served at 8 a.m., lunch from 1 to 2, and dinner or supper at 7. We have access to a few menus from this era, featuring such delicacies as gooseberry tart, caviar sandwiches, and filet of sole. Next up, we go to the smoking room. Entered through oak panel doors, the room itself adorned with gorgeous stained glass. The whole room is held up by these ornamental wooden pillars. And that floor tile pattern may seem familiar because a similar fleur-de-lis one was used on the second class of Titanic. The room also had a big glass ceiling in the middle over these tables, and most people sat in these booths, like at Denny's. And if you know the upper class of the Gilded Age, you'll probably see a similar amount of drug addicts. Now, Adriatic was the first ship to boast a Turkish bath, a feature mimicked for a little while on subsequent ships. The first class lounge is another location of note, where tasteful music would be played, and folks would first converse with other pretentious rich people at the start of voyages. Adriatic's reading and writing room was another extremely fancy location on board, with Scientific American in 1907 reporting, quote, The scheme of decoration is of a delicate character, comprising paneling and ornamentation in low relief. Thank God all that construction money didn't go to the poor. Look at this place. The Adriatic's library on the boat deck was also pretty popular, and was larger than the ones on her sisters. Adriatic also boasted one of the first elevators ever at sea, which ran from the boat deck to the saloon deck. First-class cabins were standard fancy for the era, with straight-up beds instead of just berths. Now, with private bathrooms gaining popularity, Celtic had four suites with private bathrooms. Adriatic had a habit of fixing Celtic's insufficiencies, and had 12 of these quote-unquote suites of rooms with private bathrooms. I think it's a little sad that that's the bar, but I'm just your average pauper, so what do I know? Second class seems more our speed, and who couldn't enjoy all this? A dining saloon finished with white and gold with some gorgeous wooden pillars that are certainly not hiding structural supports. Still, this was a true dining saloon with long tables. The chairs had this leaf carving, and tables had large slots for holding your food in place when seas got rocky. The saloon spanned the entire width of the ship, which was actually an extension that made it larger than the saloons of her sisters. The smoking room was framed with oak and walnut dado, which was actually my nickname in college, and featured lots of leather upholstery. It was remarkably similar to its counterpart on the Baltic, just a lot bigger. The lounge was pretty sweet, and much like every other ship of the era, it was a scaled-down version of the first-class one. Second-class passengers mostly slept in berths within their cabins, but compared to third, they were very comfortable. Passengers each had a wash basin and public restrooms to accommodate their needs not satisfied by the wash basin, unless you're already a few beers in. All second-class accommodations were situated at the aft end of the ship, with most public spaces located in the superstructure. Adriatic's second-class accommodations were far superior to that of her sisters, but fortunately there wasn't much jealousy, because ships can't have feelings. Adriatic could accommodate 500 second-class passengers. In third class, I'm not going to waste much time. It has a dining saloon and bare-bone rooms that are very clean and pretty good for where you are. It's comparable to a modern German prison. Very orderly and clean, but you're not going to go very far. The dining saloon looks as if you strip second class of all of its fancy accommodations, but it was designed to house more people. The smoking room looks much the same. Third class were accommodated from the forward to the amidship section of the hull, and Adriatic could accommodate 1,900 third class passengers in total. So, on August 23, 1902, Harland and Wolfe were given orders to begin Adriatic's construction, and after gathering materials, her keel was laid down on November 18, 1902. Unfortunately, her order was suspended until January 19 of the following year. Progress was made through the year very slowly framing up her hull and double bottom, which was not complete until January of the following year, not even being fully plated until May 29, 1905, two and a half years after her keel was laid. All of her sisters had been launched sooner than her plating was completed. Her propelling machinery wasn't even allowed to continue until July of that year for some reason. These delays were probably the result of changes to internal design resulting from feedback from her sister's passengers, and because of the new Hapag liner SS America, which was built on Baltic's old slipway. The SS America was incredibly fancy, boasting an a la carte restaurant and even telephones in some of her suites. 
Adriatic had to compete with the SS America, especially because it was, you know, right there. She was launched on September 20th, 1906, and finally delivered on April 25th, 1907, coming in with a gross tonnage of 24,580 tons. She was not the largest ship in the world, however, the SS Kaiserin August Victoria having claimed that title a year earlier, and being the largest ship in the world was an honor that all three of Adriatic's sisters held. This black sheep title, however, has made her arguably more beloved than her sisters in our strange little ship community, and honestly, I'm all for it. Five days after she was handed over, Harland and Wolf first recorded the orders for yard numbers 400 and 401, which years later would be Olympic and Titanic. Finally, Adriatic would be at last ready to greet her sisters. Adriatic's engines were nothing to sneeze at. She had eight double-ended boilers like her sisters, but four more single-ended boilers were thrown in there too. She needed all of that steam for her four-cylinder quadruple expansion reciprocating engines, the largest set of that engine Harland and Wolf ever built, perhaps ever built. Don't quote me on that though. Actually, don't quote me in general. She was only marginally faster than her sisters though. It was done more for the sake of consistency in arrival and departure times. She could run comfortably about 17.3 knots, peaking at around 19 knots on a good day. Now before we get to her maiden voyage, her sea trials were boring, don't worry about that, we need to discuss a little change White Star made in early 1907. White Star was conceived initially to carry immigrants to Australia, but her Liverpool to New York route quickly became her premier route. However, Nearing Adriatic's completion, White Star announced they'd switch to have their ships depart Southampton instead, probably due to its proximity to London. Southampton had to make accommodations, dredging out portions of the harbor and probably dumping the excess mud into haphazard steerage accommodations. Adriatic departed Liverpool on May 8, 1907 to much fanfare. She was under the direction of E.J. Smith, yes, that one, who had been transferred from Baltic, and she arrived in New York on May 16th. She was greeted with similar fanfare, and she was praised by her passengers, with Robert Perks, a member of Parliament, making a public statement about how great she was. Once she returned to England, she was transferred to Southampton to begin her new route immediately. Much like the Olympic class, she still bore Liverpool on her stern as her port of registry. Officially, her route was Southampton to Cherbourg to Queenstown to New York. She was the first White Star Liner to use the new White Star Line dock in Southampton, and her sisters were delayed in getting to use it, meaning she was by far White Star's largest ship in the city. Her career went off pretty good, occasionally reporting an iceberg and occasionally hitting a gale, until mid-December when she struck a particularly bad storm on a returning voyage that delayed her arrival by about 16 hours. A more comedic story is on a voyage when she just so happened to depart Queenstown at the same time as Cunard's SS Umbria, and they kind of raced to New York, with reports being sent to the shore of who was in the lead. They were in sight of each other the majority of the voyage. Adriatic won, by the way. For whatever reason, in January of 1908, the New York Times used Adriatic's smoking room as an example of women smoking in public. News sucked back then, too. Surprisingly, White Star did not comment. So far, her early career has been pretty good. And despite a bit of a recession in 1908 limiting westbound traffic, Adriatic had been pretty successful. J.P. Morgan, certified rich guy and owner of White Star Line, actually stated he preferred Adriatic over other ships, stating that ships have personalities, and he particularly liked Adriatic. Now if anybody wants to make J.P. Morgan Adriatic fan art and they send it to me, I promise that I will put it on my Twitter as long as it isn't explicit. Anyway, on November 4th, 1908, she grounded in the Ambrose Channel and wasn't moved until five hours later. Evidently, everything is not sunshine and roses for Adriatic's early career. On March 12, 1910, a London actor shot himself right as he was departing New York, and when an officer announced it through a megaphone to the crowd requesting a tug, they only briefly stopped cheering the departure, continuing on when he was done. And the paper got the guy's name wrong when initially reporting on it. In May of 1911, Adriatic lost a bunch of her crew, including most notably E.J. Smith and First Officer Murdoch to the new liner Olympic. It's alright, a few of the crew were caught stealing from the cargo hold a few years earlier anyway. On July 26th, Adriatic was switched back to the Liverpool-New York route. White Star had a rough year in 1912, with the economy and all, but the Big Four really helped them stay afloat. After a grounding in early 1913 on the Red Hook mudflats, Adriatic continued on to a Mediterranean cruise, a role she would gradually see more of as time went on. Still, her and her sisters were mostly for passenger carrying, and by late 1914, the Big Four had collectively carried around 850,000 passengers in total. 
It's likely some of the people watching this video had ancestors travel on Adriatic and don't even know it. Now, interestingly, the owners of the White Star Line, the International Mercantile Marine Company, released an annual report for 1913 showing an order was placed for a new steamer of the so-called Adriatic class, only slightly larger at 33,000 tons. She was going to be called Germanic, and was going to be about 20 feet longer than Adriatic, and had an additional steam turbine with her standard reciprocating engines. Even her keel was laid down on July 9th of 1914, but World War I quickly ended any possibility of Germanic's completion. I have never heard of this ship before, and I think it's really interesting that, to my knowledge, none of the boat channels are reporting on the ship that could have made it the Big Five class. At the outbreak of the Great War, prequel to the Greater War, Adriatic was not immediately taken by the British government for wartime service. She was in New York when the war broke out, and quickly cancelled her August 6th departure. Ultimately was only delayed by two days. She was the first British passenger steamer to leave New York after war was declared, and her departure was legendary with people lining the piers and anchored ships cheering her on, traitorously singing God Save the King. Adriatic's officers were soon informed that they were going to be followed by the Vaterland, an enormous German liner, which, by the way, there were rumors going back many years that all German passenger ships kept guns in their cargo holds to be mounted and positioned if necessary. I like to imagine they still do this. Putin oversteps and you see a Tomahawk missile launched out of the Eider Perla. Anyway, Adriatic was understandably nervous about being trailed by a demon, but it turned out to be the Belgian liner Vaterland. Consonants wouldn't be invented for another few years. Adriatic and her sister Baltic worked together on the Liverpool-New York route, keeping White Star afloat while their fleet was slowly shrunk by the Krauts. Adriatic still proved beneficial in this role, as her enormous cargo hold allowed her to carry tons of food to take back to Britain. The US government was always suspicious of Adriatic, thinking she might be making runs to Halifax to pick up Canadian troops while under the guise of a passenger ship. There isn't a lot of evidence for that, but we know for sure that she carried 150 trucks and even some airplanes for the British government, and we know for certain she made some calls in Halifax. Adriatic actually carried Canadian Prime Minister Sir Robert Borden to London soon after the war began too. On April 12, 1917, Adriatic was finally requisitioned by the British government to become a troop carrier for the states as they entered the war. Some guns were thrown on her decks that saw no action. Adriatic proved very useful not only for carrying troops, but her large fuel bunkers allowed her to refuel warships as she made her runs. This would prove not smart in the long run, because in January of 1918 a massive fire broke out on her bow crawling up the forward superstructure. It was put out by dunking her entire forward half with water and straight up flooding the bridge. She was still needed desperately at this point in the war, however, so they slapped some Neosporin on there and sent her back out until February of the following year. Right after the war ended, on December 16, 1918, Adriatic was set to depart Liverpool loaded with Christmas mail, passengers, and 1,600 tons of cargo. An explosion in the low-pressure intermediate cylinder on her starboard side, two hours before departure, prevented her leaving. This explosion launched the three-ton metal cylinder cover against the overhead beams. Nobody was hurt, but with a bunch of on-edge World War I veterans on board, a loud explosion mixed with crashing metal could not have been good for anyone to hear. They just cut out the cylinder, and she ran as a triple expansion engine to prevent delays. After all that nonsense, she was fixed up and given back for full-time passenger stuff. Adriatic was eventually sent back to the Southampton New York route, filling in the gap for the Britannic, which rested comfortably on the ocean floor, and the Oceanic, which was slowly and agonizingly ripped apart by the waves while grounded north of Britain. Adriatic was removed from the Southampton route, replaced by the enormous Majestic, a captured German liner that was 56,000 gross registered tons. She began doing more Mediterranean cruises, a sort of midlife crisis at this point, carrying lots of famous folks including author H.G. Wells. Everything went swimmingly until Adriatic departed Queenstown on August 6, 1922 for what would be an eventful voyage. On the 10th, Adriatic's reserve fuel bunker was open so the crew could figure out how much fuel they had left. Not soon after, an enormous explosion in the number 3 hold happened at 1.30 a.m., not only jarring awake passengers, but killing five crewmen and injuring three more. 49-year-old fireman Stephen McGinnis was never found, presumed to have been thrown overboard by the blast. Adriatic would be repaired soon after, and her senior second engineer, James Corrigan, was awarded a gold watch by the line for his bravery in saving multiple trapped stokers. Adriatic was soon repaired, and the following year started making occasional calls at Boston. Unfortunately, the US government started to curb immigration in the early 1920s, so cargo kept the ships profitable. In April of 1928, Adriatic followed the trend of the era by switching to becoming a cabin ship, housing cabin class, tourist class, and third class. Passenger numbers went up drastically as a result. 
Afterwards, Adriatic briefly served as a boys' cruise ship to the Mediterranean, taking many aspiring youths to places like the Holy Land. Adriatic's cruising days really exploded by the early 30s, with the Depression in full swing. She had some intense modifications to modernize her, now having 330 cabin class berths, 64 permanent tourist class berths, and 404 permanent third class berths. These numbers could be increased if necessary, but honestly, it never really was. Adriatic was aged and not half as popular as in her heyday. She made her final round trip to New York on the 24th of February, 1934, carrying a pitiful 229 passengers upon departure. Soon, portions of her interior were repainted, with the reading and writing room now able to be used as a cinema for trash silent films the weird girl in your grade will call art. The lounge was given a pale avocado green similar to the painted grand staircase of Olympic. On March 29, 1934, she departed for a scouters and guiders cruise to the Mediterranean. She returned from her last cruise on September 13th, and the public soon found out that she would be sold to the highest bidder. White Star had been forcibly merged with Cunard, their old rival, and much of her fleet was being scrapped to keep the joint company afloat. On December 19, 1934, she departed Liverpool, bound for Japan, where she would arrive in March of the following year, having been sold for £45,500. That's 210,067,360 Ugandan shillings. On May 15th, her entry on the British Registry was formally closed, and on the 16th, her certificate was received for cancellation. The Big Four collectively carried 1.5 million passengers just on the England to New York route. They were arguably the most successful class of White Star liners, period, and Adriatic was generally the most popular. So what did we learn? Well, I made a really dated Big Four video a couple of years ago, and I'm too lazy to remember the lesson from that one, so I guess today's lesson is that it's never too late to fix the mistakes of your past. I'm Marcus from Nautical Study, and I will see you all later. Hopefully not too much later.